need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life. All I Trust what you say that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. I need you. Soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me. All I am, I serve. what you say that you're good and your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life give me faith to trust what you say that you're good and your love Cause I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail, my God, you never will. Cause I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail, my God, you never will.
running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been saved. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. song we could ever sing and worthy of all the praise we could ever bring and worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus the name above every other name and Jesus the only one who could ever say and worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me every song we could ever sing and worthy of all the praise we could ever bring and worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. my eyes in wonder 
trust in you alone and I will not be shaken Lord as we enter into this service this first service of this new year that's not just a song that we sing Lord that's that's our prayer today we want to we want to build our lives upon your love so that when difficulties come, when trials and tribulations and problems and, and hardship comes, we won't be shaken because our faith is on solid ground. The foundation is, is that of your love. So we would say, Lord, during those times when, when we take our eyes off of you and we forget that you would forgive us, for our lack of faith. We want to believe, help our unbelief. Sometimes, Lord, that's a reality in each one of our lives. But this moment, at this place, as you've heard our desires, our, our praise, our prayers, and, and they lift up to your throne as a sweet spelling aroma, we would ask that you would hear our prayers. We pray for this service. The words that are sung, the, the, the words that are preached from your word, 
all the things that we do in this service, may it give glory to you. Forgive the speaker his sins, for they are many. We want to come to this place, Lord, to sit at your feet, to learn from your word through your servant. And we come to this place to see Jesus in this new year. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray in your name. Amen. service this morning. Just want to let you know that in the back on the, there's a little desk to the left on your way out of the chapel, if you are a woman um, or a girl who attends our congregation and are interested in a women's Bible study, there are two books out there. We're allowing you to kind of vote which one you would like to participate in. And there are two options of times. When we had our little thing uh, back in November or October, uh, we talked about what day of the week would be best, and we had lots of options and, and suggestions. So there are two choices, either a Thursday night at 7 p.m., and it would be every other. So it would be the second and fourth Thursday, or the second and fourth Saturday at 10 a.m. So you can choose that. There are two books back there, great books. They are not necessarily a book study, but they are digging deeper into our relationship with Christ, both of them. One is asking the Lord to hear our fervent prayer, our the cries of our heart, and then the other is about a more intimate relationship with Christ. So take a look at those. Uh, sign up if you are a woman, which one, and I will we'll go with... Um, Whichever has the most votes is, is what we'll do, and those are the times and the dates that we'll do that. But we will not start this until Daniel is over, um, because I have committed to doing Daniel um, all the way through the end of it, and we are on chapter 10. That is the announcement for tomorrow at 6.30. Um, you can either join us on Zoom or at Joyce's house if you need the address. Uh, see Joyce or see Pastor Terry who can remember the address. I can tell you that you turn right after you pass Stripes uh, from my house. Uh, where you're coming from, that might be a different story. Um, so uh, get those in, that information. Then tonight at 6 o'clock is a Zoom prayer. It is intercessory prayer. So if you are interested, uh, be there on Zoom if you need more information. Um, many of those you can see Doug, you can see Pastor Terry, you can see Joyce, uh, they all will have some information on that. So that is basically everything that is happening. Uh, so if you are not connected in one way or another through Bible study or through uh, Zoom prayer, get with somebody here and find a way to get connected because this journey is so much better when you travel with a friend. Amen. Thank you. Jose, my, it's good to see you guys. Happy New Year. Look at those beautiful babies. Uh, it's good to see all of you. I just haven't seen them in a while. Karen and JJ. JJ, thanks for, you know, pulling my fat out of the fire. Uh, I, 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 some days I just want to go over there and use the hammer that I broke on a mission trip, so I can't even use that and fix those computers that way. Uh, I think it would be uh, good. It's good to see Lori. Good to have you visiting with us. Um, and Frank has a friend, but you look familiar. No? All right. It's hard to tell behind those masks. It's good to see you all here. Uh, the new year, I, I uh, actually told Sharon that um, we were going to talk about James. And she said, why? What's wrong with James? I said, no, 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 honey. Not James. The book of James. We're starting a new series uh, and uh, we're going to uh, start right there in the book of James. I will tell you, uh, just a side note, I got pulled over last week uh, by a police officer when I was in my Mustang. I was actually on my way to go see Steve Hammett, to meet with him, and as I'm pulling out of uh, Rancho Vista, uh, Steve Sorensen called me on my phone. Now, my 68, he always gets me into trouble. I should know that. My 68 Mustang actually has, I shouldn't say this because the officer might be watching. I told him I was a pastor of Living Word Church. Um, that may have been a mistake. Uh, but my, my, the radio in my car has Bluetooth and hands-free and all that, but it's just not very good because the engine is so massive in that car and it rumbles. And, no, that's not 
through. It's just a lot, a lot of things. When you get older, a lot of things start to shake loose and make noise. And that's what's happening in my car. It happens in my body, too. But uh, so I got on the phone and I said, Steve, I'm on Yorktown Boulevard, um, and I'll call you back. Because in the rearview mirror, I did see this police cop, a uh, motorcycle cop, police cop, uh, um, a while, uh, a ways back. And so I've got to call you back. Well, as soon as I started to hang up, he turned his lights on. And he pulled me over. And uh, so we had this little conversation. He, said, you know, you can't talk on your phone while you're driving anywhere in Corpus Christi, because I said, I thought that was only in school zones. And he said, no, it's, it's everywhere. And he said, I know it's an old car. Uh, you, you really need to get a, a hands-free thing, a speaker or something like that. And so I, I looked at him. I told you all this yesterday. I looked at him and I said, yes, it's an old car. I didn't tell him what he wasn't asking. Um, and, and he gave me a warning, and so I drove on. Well, that story reminded me of another story about a state trooper that was um, on the side of the road trying to catch speeders, and uh, he sees this car kind of puttering along at 22 miles an hour. And he knows that, you know, driving slow, I tried to tell Sharon this, driving slow is just as dangerous as driving fast. So he turns his lights on, he pulls the car over, and as he's walking up, he sees that it's five elderly women. And, you know, two in the front seat, three in the back. And, um, and uh, he, he pulls up and he looks in, and, and the passengers all are wide-eyed and ghost faces. They just look freaked out. And so the driver says, well, officer, I don't, I don't understand what's going on. I was driving exactly the speed limit, and she points up to the sign, 22 miles an hour. And he kind of chuckles, and he says, ma'am, that's the route number, not the speed limit. And she, you know, embarrassed, thank you for correcting me. And uh, he started to walk back, and he said, well, can I ask you a question? He said, the, these ladies look pretty shaken up. Is everyone all right? And the driver said, oh, yes, officer, they're fine. We just pulled off of Route 127. <laughs> and there is a point to that, yeah. Uh, it is that our beliefs, yeah, if you didn't get it, have someone explain it to you later. Um, our beliefs, what we believe is vitally important because it affects our behavior. It affects what we do and how we act in the world. Uh, this is especially true, we see this in times of trouble and distress. JJ and Krista and Monty saw it this morning, you know, back there when I was about to bash a PC. If it were a Mac, it would have been fine. Uh, he knew that was coming. Uh, and I apologize for, for that. Um, what you believe will profoundly affect your behavior. Um, so let me ask you a question. As we're thinking about this, and we've got this new year ahead of us, how many of you really want to pa pass the, the tests of life, the difficulties and the trials and tribulations, and come through those trials and tribulations looking a little bit more like Jesus than like you did when you went in. I know that's, that's where I am. How many of you, uh, you know, you want to be able to, to more than survive that pain or that difficulty or that tribulation that's right now in your life? You know, family problems, financial difficulties, uh, decisions about where to go tomorrow. How many of you want to do more than survive the difficulties of this world. To be saved from despair. There's a, a lot of that outside these doors. Then turn with me to the book of James, chapter 2. If you don't know where that is, it's, it's way towards the end of your Bible. It's past all the, uh, the Onians, you know, Thessalonians. Colossians, oh yeah, the shuns do, and all those other books. James, it's on, you know, page uh, uh, 1,136 in my Bible. And let's look first at uh, 
at verse 14. I'm going to be reading from the, the English Standard Version, but it should be NIV up on the uh, screen. Uh, it says this, James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? James is saying, can that, can that faith deliver him from, you know, giving in to sin during hard times? Can that faith keep him from giving up in despair when things look hopeless and helpless outside? Can that faith... Now, listen, James is not talking about uh, salvation from hell here, that faith. What he is talking about, however, is... Uh, Avoiding that self-pity and, and uh, sin during our trials. To have a faith that can do that. That's why he brings in that what do you do, the works part of this thing. I know this is a topic that we've been battling in the church. Uh, denominations and pastors and a whole lot of people who are a whole lot smarter than me have dealt with this. But we need to address it. And I think it will be very good for us as we start out this new year. Uh, the context of James chapter 2 makes it very clear that he is talking about self-pity and sin during trials and tribulations that would cause us to take our eyes off of Christ, off of what God has for us. Do you want to be saved from that despair in your pain? Then then James is very clear. That's why I like the book of James. He just puts it right out there. If you want to be saved from despair in your pain, then use your faith to serve. One of my favorite teachers is a, is a man that I know is a favorite of some of the ladies here, Craig Grishel, uh, for a number of reasons. But he says this, talking about leadership, but he also uh, says it in regards to people. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, how do you communicate that to them? You can say it all day long, you know, I, I love you, Doug, but if I never do anything, if I never show him that I care about him, how does he know? That's what James is getting at here. We, we met a family like that, uh, that when we're in pain, James is saying, when we're dealing in hardships, in distress, the best way to pass through those times, through those, we call them thin times in, in our house, uh, the best way to get through those is to focus on helping someone else in their pain. Wilson, North Carolina, on the East Coast, uh, one year, we had four hurricanes come through in about the span of, what is it, a month or two months? And they just kind of parked off the coast, just southeast of us. So that meant that we were on, and you guys are from Texas, the dirty side of the hurricane. All the water and the wind and everything was just pushing into this whole region of uh, northeastern North Carolina. And it saturated the ground. So... Bonnie, Charles, Dennis, and then Floyd. And when Floyd came in, he came right over our community. And it wiped out 75% of the county that we lived in. I mean, it was horrible. Uh, houses, people's, all their worldly possessions, gone. Everything that they'd worked for all their lives. Livestock, you know, their farms, everything was gone for 75% of the population. Even the, uh, the cemeteries were so saturated, the ground, that caskets were floating down the river and in the waters. It was a horrible time. We started a distribution, a disaster distribution warehouse, as was our procedure, 100,000 square foot grocery store, uh, empty grocery store, and we were helping all of these people. There was one family on day one when we opened the doors, a uh, husband and wife and two teenage kids, that came in every day, 8 a.m. to 6 or 7 at night, and they worked themselves. I mean, they were amazing. 
One day we were sitting at lunch. I was sitting with the father, and I said, so tell me your story. You know, where are you from? Why are you here? Uh, uh, you know, what do you do that you can do this? And he, he said, well, I'm, I live just down the road, right outside the county. And I said, oh, so you weren't affected by the storms? He said, no, we lost everything. We're staying in a hotel here in Wilson. I said, what? Why are you here? You shouldn't be on this side of the line. You should be on the other side of the line looking to get back all of the things that you lost. And he said, no, no, no. no. He, I, I think I was a lieutenant then. or a, Yeah, I was a lieutenant. Uh, so it was a long time ago. He said, uh, no, 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 lieutenant. We understand, my wife and I understand that in order for us to get through this thing ourselves, the best way is for us to help other people. They were there all the way through this thing. We dropped well over a million dollars and helped over 900,000 people in that region uh, with all kinds of needs, rebuilding homes, furniture, all, food, everything that you can imagine. And that family was there from start to finish. Why? Because they knew what James knew. That in order to get through difficult times, trials and tribulations, difficulties in their lives, the best way to do that is to focus on helping someone else through their difficulties. Put your faith to work to help those in need. Don't just say you believe. Show that you believe by, by loving uh, others in, in their pain. Otherwise, your, your faith is, is dead. It's worthless. James chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So, James is saying that a belief without any behavior is dead. It's worthless. It, it doesn't do anything. Just because, this is an important one in today's you know, culture, just because we say it's so doesn't make it so. Just because I say I have faith doesn't make it so. I have to, here on planet Earth, prove that I have that faith. A belief that doesn't behave is no belief at all. If you want to be saved or delivered from uh, despair in your pain, then serve others in their pain. Put your faith to work. I, I think there's probably enough need out there for each one of us to find someone to help in need. Uh, that's what Harriet Tubman, Tubman did. I'm always amazed when I think about and read about what she did. 1820s, she was born to a plantation in, in Maryland. She was made to, to drive the oxen, and she had to hunt um, or trap muskrats in the woods, and she was a, um, a nursemaid, took care of her owner's children and babies. She was whipped a number of times, as a, a teenager and, and growing up, she had the horror of seeing three of her sisters be sold into slavery, never to be seen again. And at one point, when the owner was going to sell her brothers, that's when her mother stood up and openly rebelled. And the would-be buyer actually gave up because she said this, this is a mom. I mean, you, you know, you don't hook a bear? Well, you don't go near a mama bear. She said to the, the, the potential buyer, I will split open the head of the first person who walks through the doors of my house. That's, that's a mom. She's protecting her family. And then when Harriet was about 26 years old, uh, she found out that she was going to be sold into slavery. And so she said, it's time for me to escape. And she went at night, and we know the story. She traveled about 90 miles along the Underground Railroad using the North Star as a guide. And she got to Pennsylvania and freedom. Well, then she made a decision. 
a very dangerous decision for her. She risked losing her freedom to help others find theirs. In the midst of her pain, her distress, her despair, she focused on helping others in theirs. For eight years, she helped multitudes of slaves travel along that underground railroad to freedom. And she said this, too, uh, if I can find it. I never, uh, she, she gave all her glory to God, in other words. She said uh, she relied on God to guide and protect her. She never once lost a one, runaway slave. She said it this way, I never ran my train off the track or lost a passenger. I love that. And all the credit to God. She says, Twent me, twas the Lord. I always told him, trust to you. I don't know where to go or what to do, but I expect you, God, to lead me. And he always did. That's from a book called Harriet Tubman, On the Money, by Eric Metaxas. Uh, I have this, this subscription that, and I hate subscriptions, and most of you know that, but this one was too good. It's too, and I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, scribbed or scribed or something like that, S-C-R-I-B-D. Uh, it's amazing. It has hundreds of thousands of books and articles and podcasts and audiobooks. And this was apparently because of my, uh, um, my book choice previously. They thought I would like this, and they were right. It is an amazing book. But Harriet Tubman's faith was clearly demonstrated. No one who reads or knows about Harriet Tubman has to, has to guess what she believes in because her faith was uh, evident in what she did. In her pain, she reached out to others in their pain. Uh, her faith worked hard in tough times. And mine can too. Yours can too today in the tough times that you're going through. You can be saved from despair in your pain if you use it to serve others in their pain. Now, let me show you what happens when you do that. Uh, your works, what you do, show others that your faith is real. Once again, you can say all kinds of things. Just because you say them doesn't make it true. So you use your behavior to verify, to validate, to vindicate, to, to prove, to confirm to people outside what your beliefs are. The belief that you have a true faith, that it's an active faith. It's a living faith, not a dead faith. Your deeds, use your deeds to justify your doctrine. That's what I was going to name this, you know, use your deeds to justify your doctrine because I like using, what is that, alliteration when you have deeds and doctrine and do's and don'ts, I don't remember. I'm a musician, you know, not a, I mean, that's why I look at the English people here. Uh, but I decided to call it, well, it's kind of worked out because the subtitle of my sermon is The Patriarch, the Prostitute, and the Problem. Uh, so I did it anyway, and you'll have to wait to hear about what those are unless you've looked ahead. But uh, my point is this, that there are so many people who will tell you today that what you believe doesn't really matter, that your faith, it isn't that important, uh, that, that your faith in God isn't really that big a deal. Uh, doctrine is irrelevant. It's old-fashioned. I love that one. Uh, they say, you know, we're just going to be good people and love God. Eh, we're not going to worry so much about theology, about why we love God. And that's what these false teachers are doing in James' day, too. If you look at verse 18, they were saying that faith is worthless. And this is their argument. A lot of people think that these are James' words. No, he's recording what foolish people are saying. Verse 18 says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, they're saying faith isn't important. Works are. And this is not at all what James is saying. That's what the false teachers are saying in his day. And they support their argument by this next verse, uh, verse 19, when they talk about uh, saying that demons have the same belief 
that God is God, and it really hasn't helped them that much. Uh, people say they believe in many things, but do they do anything uh, about that faith, that belief? You can just go on Facebook right now and look and see what people say they believe, what they put their faith in. But then look a little deeper and ask them, well, what do you do about that? If you believe that, what are you doing to change that? And then there are those that have beliefs and they are doing everything to promote and to, to give example of what they believe. It works on both sides, good and bad. But how many of us who believe that God is God, that he hears us, and we have faith in who he is, how many of us actually do something about that faith that's within us? Uh, and, and you kind of see the argument of these false teachers, don't you? What you believe isn't important. They say demons believe, and it really doesn't help them. Your faith is worthless, and it sounds just like things that you could hear outside today. So don't worry about it. But then James responds to them in verse 20. Look at that. Uh, James says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person? Some translations get a little bit harder than that, uh, but I'm trying to keep it, you know, sensible. Uh, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless, idle, or lazy? In other words, faith and works go together. They have to exist together. You can't have one without the other. Because if you always, if, if what you believe always affects the way you behave, then you've got to do something about what you believe. If it doesn't, your faith is idle, it's lazy, it's dead, it's no good. Those false teachers were telling them all of these things when, in fact, exactly the opposite is true. Your faith works. Your true faith, real faith, works. The Christian faith, contrary to many other faiths, uh, is very useful. When you put your trust in Jesus, in the Jesus of the Bible, uh, there is always a very real change in your life for the better. Christian faith is not idle or lazy. It always uh, leads to and is very active in the lives of those who hold it. Um, one of the other books that came to me through this subscription is uh, a book called Is God a Moral Monster by uh, Paul Copen. This was, this was because I've, I've uh, read Ravi Zacharias' books, and this guy and, and Ravi uh, kind of parallel some of the things they did. But in his book, he, um, he lists many of, these, of the positive achievements of Christians over two millennia. And he says, uh, and he lists quite a few of them, and I wanted to bring some of them, because they're, it's interesting to see what Christians have done throughout history, and many of them, some of them, we may not know about. What about radic eradicating slavery? In, uh, uh, as the Christian faith spread all over Rome, slavery dwindled. It decreased. Historical documents talk about this. The practice of slavery dwindled, and then centuries later, when slavery reemerged, there were Christian advocates like the Mennonites and the Quakers and, and uh, William Wilberforce who not just strongly opposed it, but they were, their faith caused them to be uh, somewhat violent, not the Mennonites and the Quakers, but individuals about eradicating slavery again. Uh, opposing infanticide. There was this... Uh, this process, I think it was called exposure or something, uh, in the Roman, the Greco-Roman culture where they um, uh, abandoned infants. It was common practice. And the Christians led reforms in the fourth century to eliminate that. Um, eliminating gladiatorial games. This means Camp Gladiator would be no more if there were active Christians in the world today. Sharon, are you listening? Maybe she'll... That, that, that brutal sport, though, was... Obviously, we know that. It was about using slaves and the death of slaves for the entertainment of the masses. 
And it didn't matter if they were Christians or not. It was just slaves. So, you know, it was condemned by Christian activists, and I want to be one of those who condemn gladiatorial games. We need to make that movement, James. Building hospitals and hospices. Those were started by Christians. By the Christians. Early Christians organized resources to care for the sick and dying. It was not the normal practice. Elevating women's uh, status and, and rights. Uh, women have been mistreated in almost every culture since the beginning of time. But look at Jesus' model. He held women in very high regard and dignified them. Early Christians protected women and children uh, from neglect and abuse, promoting higher education. Europe and North America, some of our, our best institutions of learning, uh, Oxford, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, they were all founded on Christian principles to train uh, pastors and missionaries. These are some of the achievements. And of course we know about great works of literature and, and philosophy, uh, Augustine and Dante and Milton and, and many others, beautiful works of art and sculpture and architecture, architecture, you know, English is apparently my second language, uh, music, uh, Bach and, and uh, 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 Mendelssohn and Haydn and, and uh, you know, what, what was the thing that we sang with your dad? Who was that? Handel, yes. Why couldn't I think of his name? Um, but Christianity has created a multi-ethnic, global community that, uh, that most of the achievements listed from, you know, his book, they flowed typically from the Western world, um, but throughout history, lives and cultures and, and peoples have been transformed by one thing, their faith in Christ. The power of Christ and their belief in him has transformed our world in so many areas. Genuine faith. So the Christian faith works. It works on both levels. And if it's not working for you, then maybe you better make sure that you're believing in the right thing, that your faith is real. You know, uh, you better make sure that you're trusting the, the Christ of the Bible, the Jesus of the Word of God, and not some magic words or incantations that we were taught to recite when we were little, or things that we did years ago, the legacy that we held. Why am I a Christian today? Well, because my parents were a Christian. I inherited it from them. My faith at that point is just a, a word that I say because I was told to say it. My beliefs will dictate my behavior. Genuine faith in God, the one true God, is not worthless. It truly does work. Use your words to demonstrate your faith. Uh, behave in such a way that people will know that your faith is real, like Abraham. That, that's the patriarch. Uh, James 21 through 24. James 2, 21 through 24 says this. Uh, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Um, I know some of you are going to say, well, doesn't the Bible also tell us that, that we're justified by faith apart from works? Yeah, it does. In, in Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Uh, it'll be on the screen. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So what is that? Is James directly contradicting other parts of Scripture? Paul? You know, you don't mess with Paul because people get really upset. Paul is, you know, he's important. He's not doing that. It's a different context completely. Uh, when Paul says in Romans 3 that, that faith is 
apart from works, he's using that in a, in a legal sense. It's actually a vertical sense. It's talking about God declaring Abraham righteous, sinless, forgiving him of his sins. To be justified in that context means to be declared righteous. God, the judge of the universe, declares uh, the believing sinner righteous or free from sin, not guilty, rather. That's probably a better way to say it. Uh, that's, that's the believer's legal stand before God. It's a legal term when Paul uses it. When James says it here in James chapter 2, he's, that a person is justified by works, he's using it in more of a practical sense. Paul is using it that God justifies and declares someone righteous so that their faith is separate from the works. But here on planet Earth, when we are trying to communicate what our faith is and how important it is to those around us, the only way that someone is going to know what your faith is if, is if they see you behaving in a way that supports your claim. I am a man of faith, but I do things that say exactly the opposite. I get angry and I curse computers. No, if you're a person of faith, then you're going to do things that promote and reinforce and show people in a visible, concrete way that you are a person of faith. There's something different about you. He isn't talking about the legal declaration of righteousness from God. He's talking about a practical demonstration of righteousness in our lives. Matthew eleven nineteen 19 uses that same uh, word and for the same purpose uh, about wisdom in regards to wisdom. A person demonstrates righteousness by his or her works. Um, uh, in the same way regards to wisdom is justified or vindicated by her deeds. That's how people know how do you know if a, if a wise person is wise? How do you know that, that if a person of faith has true faith? You watch what they do. A wise person isn't going to do foolish things. A person of faith in God isn't going to do things that contradict and go against the things of God. Uh, now, God can declare a person righteous because he can do one thing that no one on earth can do. He looks in and sees your heart. He sees what's on the inside. We can't know someone else's heart. So we have to see it in a real and visible way. We need works, behavior, what we do to demonstrate what we believe, like it or not. People look on the outward appearance. First Samuel 16, 7, if you watched uh, the devotionals the other day. Uh, so they cannot know your faith is real unless they see it in action. That's, that's what I saw. I heard a lot about, for instance, uh, from James, the, uh, the Casas project, the mission trip. But until I was up there and I saw people working hard and putting all these pieces together, long hours in you know, cold sometimes and hot other times, until I saw them doing what they said they believed, then I knew that this is true. This is legit. Because I saw them working and, and acting out their faith by how they lived their lives. And people that have done that over and over and over again. That's how it worked for Abraham. God declared him righteous in Genesis 15 before he ever got to a mountain in Genesis 22 and put his son on an altar ready to do what God had commanded him to do. In Genesis 15, God declared him righteous and no one else could see it. In Genesis 22, when Abraham did what God had commanded him to do, there was no one that could deny that this man followed, obeyed, uh, uh, the God of the universe and was a man of great faith to the point where God calls him a friend. That's when people knew Abraham's faith was real. Abraham used his works, his behavior, to vindicate, to prove, to validate and verify his faith. And that's what 
Rahab did as well. So there's the second word, the patriarch, the prostitute, and we've already been introduced to the problem. James 2.25. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? I don't like the English Standard Version. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received... It says the same thing. Never mind. But they weren't just messengers. They were spies. They were in enemy territory. And when Rahab took them in and hid them and sent them out to their safety, she put herself at risk. Why? Because in that moment, she believed that what they were saying about their God was true, and she had faith that he and his people would take care of her and her people. Her, her works, her faith was verified and vindicated by her actions. Now, there's a huge difference between Abraham and Rahab. Abraham was a man. Rahab was a woman. Abraham was a Jew. He was the father of the Jewish people. And Rahab was a Gentile. Abraham was known for his faith. Rahab was known for her profession. I mean, she went through history as known as Rahab the harlot. That would be like, saying, you know, Terry the, I don't know, jerk. If you see me drive, some of you may say that. Uh, I'm just barely saved when I'm driving. Rahab was known for her profession. Abraham was known for... So they are on complete opposite ends of the spectrum as far as we uh, uh, look at and judge and, and evaluate. But both of them vindicated their faith by what they did by their works. Abraham, when he offered Isaac and Rahab, when she hid the spies in her house, they, they demonstrated their faith to a watching world by their works. And can I say that that's what God calls each one of us to do as believers? He calls each one of us to do that very thing. Show the world that your faith is real by the things that you do, by the way that you live, by the work that you do, the people that you serve, not just by the words that you say, especially during times of, of trial and tribulation, of difficulties. And because that's when people are watching you the most, isn't it? That's when they look at you and say, let's see what this person is like during a pandemic. Let's see what this person is like when, when we tell them that they've lost their job. Let's see what this person is like in this situation. They watch us as Christians, especially when things are not going well. I heard a believer say, uh, or a pastor on a radio one time say, that he believes that whenever an unbeliever gets cancer, God allows a believer to get cancer just so the world can know the difference. I don't know that I believe that. But I will tell you that I do know this, that we as Christians are not exempt from trials and tribulations. We're not exempt from bad things happening to us. Uh, we will go through difficult things trials and hardship. The difference for us is that we depend on, uh, on the Lord during those difficult times. And that doesn't mean we're not going to have moments that we fail and falter in our faith. It doesn't mean that you're going to have a, a perfectly smooth faith all the way through those trials and tribulations, those difficulties that means that sometimes someone's going to send a, a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ to you to help you walk along that trial, that difficulty. Someone is going to pray for you. Someone is going to be there. They may not say a word. They may just be there. And that's important. The point is this. Don't hide your faith, Don't, especially in times of difficulty. Let your faith be shown. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world, especially when you're in those valleys. 
demonstrate to a watching world so that they can see that, uh, that your faith uh, really works and delivers you through that pain. There's a story about an author from Australia named Tim Winton. Uh, it's from preachingtoday.com. Uh, I, I saw it about 10 years ago, uh, and, and, and studying and looking at this uh, text, it reminded me of it. Tim was a journalist, a, a, or a novelist. He wrote a lot of you know, really good books, and he was pretty famous in the western coast of Australia. And at one point, he was allowed to go on a television show and talk about his faith. And, and so he talked about this story that was really powerful. He was five years old. His dad was a cop. His dad had been in a terrible accident. Uh, a, a drunk driver knocked him off his motorcycle, and he was in a coma. Well, in Australia back in the 60s, basically what they did was they got him comfortable and stable, and then they took him home, and they put his dad in a chair and said, here's your dad. And this five-year-old little boy was, was horrified by that experience. I mean, it, he said it kind of looked like my dad, but he was all busted up and bruised and broken. Uh, he, his dad was also a big man, and his mom was having a difficult time getting him from the bed into the bath. He, she just couldn't do it. And Tim was five years old. He couldn't help. Well, the community found out about it, and one day there was a knock on the door, and his mom opened up the door, and the guy there, I guess he said, good day, you know, and... Uh, I heard that your hubby was ill. Is there anything I can do to help? His name was Len Thomas, and he was from the local church. And he just wanted to support this family somehow. So every day, this man would come over, and he would pick up Tim's dad and carry him into the bath and wash him and then dress him and put him back in his bed. And he did that every day that summer until his dad was back on his feet. Tim calls it this strangely sacrificial service. He said, this, this strangely sacrificial act really touched me, watching a grown man bother for nothing to show up and care for a sick man. Uh, he also said that that one man and that act of service transformed him and his whole family. He has aunts and uncle, uncles and, their cous and his cousins and, and a large group of people that came to Christ because one man came over and, and took his dad every day into the bath and washed him as a service to the Lord. Helped them during their time of pain. They saw his faith. That family saw that his faith was real, and they wanted it too. I don't know what you have, but if it allows you to do things like that, then, then I want it too. In the same way, we need to let our faith be seen so that people know it is real. Uh, James 2, verse 26 for as the, the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. As a believer in Christ, you can rest assured that you don't have a dead faith. Your faith is living. It's active in your lives. I know some of the stories, and some of you don't know that I know what you know. I haven't had enough coffee today. You have a living faith, which demonstrates itself in good works and the things that you do. So, use your faith to serve wherever you may be. Whether it's at home, helping your mother do dishes. I hope that helps. Whether it's at college, you know, in these times, showing other people your own age the faith that you have and that it makes a difference in your life and it can make a difference in theirs too. Use your faith to serve. Then use your works to show that your faith is real. It'll save you from despair in the midst of your trials and it'll bring others through and out of theirs. It's time for us, church, to show a hurting world outside those doors that faith is real, that your faith is real, 
and that it helps. It, it, it prevents us from the despair that is so prevalent in the world today and depression and anxiety and all of those things. Help them through the pain that they have. As we start this new year, I want you to know one thing. Your faith really works. If you have faith in Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, then your faith really works. And you don't have to worry about how people respond to it. You just step out and you do what God has called you to do. And he takes care of the rest. And people will see that faith and the results of it. And they will get through their pain and their hardship. And who knows what God has in store for each one of us in this new year. Pray with me. Lord, faith is, a, is an easy thing to uh, say that we have, and sometimes it's a difficult thing to practice outside those doors. Sometimes it's scary. Sometimes we know that you're telling us, you're guiding us, you're, you're instructing us to do something. And, and sometimes, Lord, in, in reality, our, our faith just isn't strong enough for us to actually do what you've called us to do. So we would pray in those situations, Lord, give us faith as we, as we sang earlier today. Help us, Lord, to evaluate what it is we believe how much we believe it and what we're willing to do because of what we believe. Allow our faith to be real and living and active and powerful in our lives because right now, probably more than at any other time in our lives, people need to see the faith of the church, of Christians. As we move about in the, in the world of darkness, You've given us a light. You've given us this special gift. And we're not supposed to keep it to ourselves. So help us, Lord, to show others our faith by the things that we do. Not here in this place, but outside these doors. As we're at work and at home and with our family and our loved ones and our friends and strangers as we move about. We pray your blessing upon... Living Word Church in this new year, we know you have things at work for the church. We, we ask that you would continue to bless us, bless our families, keep us all strong and healthy uh, as we travel, protect us, as we go about our, our lives, keep us safe. Those that need a special healing touch, those that are in pain, and uh, illness has taken them. Lord, place your hand upon them as the great physician and begin the healing process now. Those that are in pain, relieve the pain. Take it away, Lord. We pray for those that, are, that have surgeries coming up. There are names that come to our minds. We pray for those who are uncertain as to what will happen in work this week. We pray that you would continue to speak to us, to be with us, to guide us, and to lay out your plan before us. Now, Lord, as we continue in our service, we would ask that you would continue to be with us and your spirit to move within us. And we pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that, to give back blessings that you've given to us. We know that through our giving, you will bless us too, again and again, until it heaps and flows over. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.